Hi guys, I thought that it was high time that I talked some more about German books on this channel. And it was always going to be a video about classics because I have a very difficult relationship with contemporary German literature. I've talked about this before and I will most likely talk about it again in the future. But not today, because today's video is supposed to be a positive one for a change. We haven't had that many of those recently. I have some disclaimers to make, as per usual. Two disclaimers, to be precise. The first one is that I am very intentionally not calling this video my five favorite German classics, because almost certainly the existence of some of my favorites completely slipped my mind. And I will most likely make a similar video again in the future, a few months from now, probably. My second disclaimer is that when we talk about German in a literature context, the word German is always meant to mean the German language, not a, a national German literature. We don't make any distinction between the national literatures of German-speaking countries in the school curricula, the university curricula. The publishers are often the same anyway and have been historically. And some of the most famous German-speaking writers were not German nationals. Franz Kafka, for instance, and even at the time when the two classic German writers, Goethe and Schiller, were writing, a German nation-state didn't even exist yet, except maybe as an idea, and that idea certainly or most often encompassed Austria, for instance, as well. So there's never been any sense in making any arbitrary distinction between the national literatures in the German language area. And in fact, my five authors that I'm going to talk about today come from very different regions in this language area. And out of the five books that these authors wrote and that I'm going to talk about today, two are novellas and the remaining three are plays because there are actually very few novels in the German canon comparatively speaking, if we compare it to the English and the American canon, for instance. And I myself like these three plays better than almost any prose text from the German canon that I've read, except obviously for the two that I'm going to talk about today. So without even further ado, let's get into it. Um, I am <laughs> some more ado, sorry. I I'm going to go roughly backwards in time. It's not consistent in the end, um, but I'm going to start with some very modern, modern German classics. And my first book is one of the plays. It is Die Physiker, The Physicists by Friedrich Dürrenmatt. Friedrich Dürrenmatt was a very prolific Swiss writer of the post-war period. And in The Physicists, we are introduced to three physicists who are currently living in a psychiatric institution where they are treated for some kind of psychotic condition in which they are under the delusion that they are Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton and King Solomon, respectively. It's hilarious in the beginning. Uh, you can imagine the kind of scenes that play out. But then we get to the bottom of what caused this condition and it's very, very sobering indeed. It's easy to spoil it and I think it's important not to spoil it because it's not nearly as hard-hitting if you know the revelation beforehand. So that's all I'm going to say about the plot of this one. But I'd like to point out that the play is not, as you might think, an exploration of personal mental health or psychology. It's rather a political and social commentary. My next book is one of the novellas and it's from Hungarian author Udön von Horvath. It's called Jugend ohne Gott, Youth without God and it's a direct translation of the German title. 
And I think the title is somewhat unfortunate because it perpetuates that myth that atheists are inherently anti-social psychopath because without the specter of judgment day hanging over you there's nothing to keep you accountable and you are basically free to act as evil and as anti-socially as you like. I think this is a very sad view of humanity and maybe the people who say these things are projecting just a little bit too much of themselves onto other people. But be that as it may, fortunately the title is, as far as I remember, not used in the text itself. It's more, it's more like a commentary on the text. This is a story told by a school teacher about a school trip that he took with his class and something went wrong during the trip and kept getting more and more wrong. Um, it's an accusatory story about or against mob mentality and ultimately fascism as it unfolds in the microcosm of a school class. This might sound it might remind you of Lord of the Flies, but it's very different, especially in tone. It's much more low-key and there's no exaggeration necessary, no alienation. And this makes it all the more disquieting because it feels so much closer to home. On the more light-hearted and entertaining side, we have the tale Der Goldene Topf, The Golden Pot or The Golden Flower Pot by E.T.R. Hoffman, who is the author of the internationally more famous, I think, Nutcracker and um, The Sandman. But this is my favorite tale of his. E.T.R. Hoffman was the master of the spooky tale and also the master of the convoluted story within a story kind of story, <laughs> kind of plot. And he always writes with a lot of humor and a lot of conscious exaggeration, a lot of exaggerated stereotypes and sometimes reversals of these stereotypes and that makes all his stories comical as well as spooky and creepy. And the Golden Pot is the story of a university student who accidentally knocks over a basket of apples one day and is cursed by the apple seller which is the beginning of a wild and helter-skelter tumble down a rabbit hole into a world of magic and superstition and occultism, which this student never suspected exists and which he is entirely unprepared for. It's almost like a romp through the history of occultism itself, with all the elements that you would expect to find in there. It's a comical but also genuinely suspenseful and spooky. The only complaint that I have about it is that it operates with very traditional gender roles, which by the way I think is not the case in The Sandman, which puts these roles a bit onto their head. So recommendation for The Sandman as well after you've read this one. Of my fourth classic, I only have a very old copy that I used in school and that I have doodled on wildly. <laughs> it's Kabale und Liebe by Friedrich Schiller. Um, intrigue and love in English and it's one of the plays again. This is Romeo and Juliet but socially conscious and therefore better if you ask me. The title sounds completely frivolous, but it's the opposite, really. It's the story of a love affair between a prince called Ferdinand and a middle-class woman called Louise, and it's contemporary to when it was written in 1784. This love affair has strong opponents at the court, and these courtiers won't stop at anything to drive the two lovers apart. Um, they don't care if it destroys Louisa and her family, and ultimately, neither does Prince Ferdinand, really. 
he wants Louisa for himself, but he doesn't care about the consequences. Unlike Louisa, who is very conscious of the impact that her actions have or might have on her family and the responsibility that he has, uh, she has towards them. So ultimately, the behavior of the responsible, considerate, principled, strong middle-class woman gets contrasted with that of the rash, selfish, oblivious and privileged nobleman. And the latter comes out of this comparison looking considerably worse. And the two are, of course, meant to be representative of their respective class. So in true Schiller fashion, it's an invective against the nobility and a celebration of the bourgeoisie that is in the process of forming its collective identity at the time. And on top of that, it's, it's just a very entertaining and emotional love story. So if you ever see this staged somewhere, do yourself a favor and go watch it. My last classic doesn't necessarily come with a recommendation and I'll tell you why in a little while. I'm almost afraid to say which one it is because it is a bit of a cliche and also some people might think that I'm lying because it isn't usually considered to be the most fun of German texts but I genuinely enjoyed it and it's because I think the first time that I came into contact with it was when my class actually staged it. So my approach to it was from the beginning a very theatrical and playful one and that I think influenced my reading a great deal. The text that I'm talking about is of course Faust by Goethe. Um, these are Fausts 1 and 2. The first one, which I'm talking about, is only about 200 pages long in this edition. This is, of course, the well-known story of the elderly or late middle-aged scholar Faust, who is looking back on a lifetime of research and scholarship and realizes that he has nothing to show for it in terms of any real knowledge of the inner workings of the universe. And in this frustrated state, he is susceptible to seduction by demons and thus gets seduced into making a pact with one of them called Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles is sometimes called the devil, but this is in fact wrong. He is not the devil, he is a devil, meaning a demon. And he isn't even a terribly powerful one. He can be banned by a simple pentacle, which would not impress the real devil very much. But he is powerful enough to give Faust the knowledge that he craves and any anything else that he craves. But of course, a pact like that always comes with a price and in the end it doesn't go too well, especially though for other people. So this is, like I said, an old story and the story is not unimportant in this play, but what makes it such an entertaining read or if you watch it, such an entertaining play um, is the incredibly inventive, smooth and elegant language. A whole lot of proverbial phrases and expressions that we have in German and that we use in everyday speech were coined by Goethe and a lot of them come from the Faust. And that of course all gets lost in translation, just as Shakespeare gets lost in translation. Goethe wasn't by far as formative for the German language as Shakespeare was for the modern English language. Goethe was writing a little too late for that. He died in 1832, but he was just a masterful wordsmith in his own way. A year or so ago I saw an English translation of this in a bookshop and I looked up the famous first scene, Faust's famous monologue about his crisis state, and it was just sad. The single most well-known 
couplet um, in, in this whole play reads in English, Yet here I am, a wretched fool, no wiser than I was before. And this just doesn't have the same music to it as the German original, which goes, Da stehe ich nun, ich armer Tor, und bin so klug als wie zuvor. And it just made me so sad to read this in English. And this is why I said in the beginning that this doesn't necessarily come with a, with a recommendation from me. Unless, of course, you are a German speaker or you, are a, um, you, you have a good firm knowledge of German as a second or third language. This isn't as hard as some people will tell you, um, except for maybe the vocabulary. But it's, it's very, uh, the, the verses and couplets run very smoothly and that makes it easy to read, I think, even if German isn't your first language. I think it's easier to read than Shakespeare is to read for non-native English speakers. And I think it's one of those classics that are genuinely enjoyable, even if some prejudiced people will tell you differently. But I'm sure that most of these people who will tell you differently haven't actually read it or only read it in a school environment that didn't really promote enjoyment of the text. But if you come to it freely out of your own initiative, I'm almost certain that you will enjoy it. So these are the five German classics that I wanted to show you. I hope I have given you some inspiration to pick up a German classic or maybe some tips if you've wanted to pick up one but weren't sure which one and where to start and what there even is to read. And this has been fun for me too and I think I might talk a little bit more about classic German literature in the past because I have, after all, studied German literature as a, what was then like a minor master's subject. Which does not, of course, mean that I'm an authority on this, but I do know some things that you might not know. Do let me know in the comments what your favorite German classics are, or which ones you're interested in picking up, and if you've read any of these, or if now you're interested in picking these up. I'll see you again very soon. Bye!